You can't see them, you can't touch them, but they're everywhere. The signal on your phone, the color in your screen, the light in your room. One man uncovered the code behind all of it, before anyone even knew it existed. Before Einstein, before relativity, before electricity powered a single city, there was a quiet genius who saw the universe as an equation. He tamed invisible forces, predicted the speed of light, and built the bridge between the seen and unseen. His name was James Clerk Maxwell. And if you've never heard of him, then prepare to see the world for the very first time. June 13th, 1831, Edinburgh, Scotland. A baby boy is born to John and Francis Maxwell, their only son. They name him James Clark Maxwell. No one knows this child will unlock the hidden laws of the universe. At Glen Lair, the Maxwell family estate, young James spends his childhood outdoors. He doesn't just play, he studies things, the way water swirls, how light bends through glass, the pattern of shadows. He asks questions most adults can't answer. And when he can't find answers, he builds experiments to find out for himself. At age 14, Maxwell writes his first scientific paper on oval curves and geometrical constructions. He isn't copying anyone. These are original ideas. The Royal Society of Edinburgh doesn't believe a child could have written it. But they publish it anyway, because the mathematics is flawless. School isn't easy for James. He's shy, different, and often bullied for his strange ideas and strong Dumfrieshire accent. But while others memorize answers, James keeps asking why things work at all. He carries string in his pockets and sketches geometrical diagrams in the margins of his books. Even the teachers don't fully understand him. In his home experiments, James uses pins, paper and thread to model the behavior of curves and shapes. He studies the colors of soap bubbles, reflections in water and light through prisms. He's not just playing, he's seeing patterns hidden to the rest of us. Patterns that will one day form the blueprint of physics itself. At just 16, James enters the University of Edinburgh. He dives into mathematics, optics and philosophy, reading everything from Euclid to Newton. While other students study formulas, James starts building the invisible connections behind them. He's no longer just curious, he's becoming a force of his own. In 1850, Maxwell transfers to Cambridge University, the most elite scientific institution in the world. Here, he'll face the best mathematicians of his generation on their turf. His tutor is William Hopkins, known as the Wrangler Maker. It's sink or swim, and Maxwell doesn't like swimming with the crowd. In his early 20s, Maxwell tackles one of astronomy's great mysteries. What are Saturn's rings made of? He proves they can't be solid or liquid. They must be countless tiny particles orbiting in harmony. No telescope could see it, but his mathematics made it clear. The professors don't just applaud, they are stunned. This quiet boy from Scotland may be the most brilliant mind they've ever seen. In 1860, James Clark Maxwell arrives in London to teach at King's College. He's young, brilliant, and already aware that brilliance makes enemies. Behind the walls of prestige lie politics, jealousy, and pressure. But Maxwell's mind is focused elsewhere, the invisible. Michael Faraday had drawn strange lines of force, loops, arcs, invisible fields moving through space. But Faraday didn't use mathematics, he just saw them with his mind. Maxwell wanted more. He wanted to trap those ghostly lines in logic. So he did what no one else could, he turned them into equations. Maxwell introduced a new idea, something radical. He said space itself could store energy, carry it, bend it. 
He called it a field, and it meant electricity and magnetism weren't just forces, they were part of space itself. For the first time in history, lightning had a logic. Not everyone believed him. Many called Maxwell's fields abstract nonsense, a trick with numbers, a fantasy. Even Faraday wasn't sure. He once said, I see lines, but I don't see calculus. But Maxwell didn't stop, because he saw something they didn't, a bigger picture. He kept working, year after year, line after line, until the laws of electricity and magnetism fit together like puzzle pieces. Eventually, it boiled down to four simple equations. Four equations that describe every electric current, magnetic force, and electromagnetic wave in the universe. Even today, they are called Maxwell's equations. Then came the moment. He plugged constants into one of his equations, measuring how electric and magnetic fields move. The result was a speed, 299,792 kilometers per second, the speed of light. Maxwell stared at it and realized light isn't special. It's an electromagnetic wave. No journalists came, no awards were given, no one shouted. Maxwell sent his paper into the world and the world shrugged. He didn't mind. He wasn't chasing fame. He was chasing truth. And truth doesn't care about applause. Maxwell died not knowing what he had done. But because of him, we have radio, television, Wi-Fi, lasers, Einstein's theory of relativity. All of it built on the waves he revealed and the equations he wrote. Maxwell didn't just explain the light. He became the reason we can see the modern world. After solving light and magnetism, Maxwell did something no one expected. He turned to heat. The laws of thermodynamics said energy always spreads out, order becomes disorder. But Maxwell wasn't satisfied. He didn't want to obey nature. He wanted to question it. He teamed up with Ludwig Boltzmann to study gas molecules. Tiny particles flying in every direction, impossible to track. But using statistics, yes, mathematics, Maxwell showed something amazing. Even total chaos had patterns. The way gas moves could be predicted. Then Maxwell played a trick on science. He imagined a tiny creature, a demon, who could cheat the rules of heat. It let fast particles through one door and slow ones through another, sorting energy perfectly. The science world was stunned. Had Maxwell just broken the second law of thermodynamics? Many scientists didn't understand what he was doing. His papers were full of symbols they'd never seen, concepts that sounded like riddles. Even friends sometimes said, Maxwell lives in a different world. But he kept going, because the truth doesn't wait for applause. Now, Maxwell looked at color, not in light, but in people. He studied how our eyes see red, green, and blue. He found that color isn't just out there, it's something our brains create. Once again, he used science to uncover what's normally invisible. In 1861, he made history again. Using red, green, and blue filters, Maxwell took the world's first color photo. It was a simple ribbon, but it changed photography forever. Once again, he proved what science could reveal beauty in plain sight. Maxwell wasn't just numbers and chalk. He wrote poetry, he read theology, he thought deeply about life, death and meaning. To him, the laws of nature weren't cold, they were a glimpse of something greater. He once said, I have never been without a belief in a higher power. By now, Maxwell had done something no one else ever had. He had explained both light and matter, waves and particles, vision and heat. The universe had order, but it also had imagination. And one quiet man had mapped it, using nothing but mathematics, curiosity and a piece of chalk.
Maxwell returned home to Glenlair, but he wasn't done. Far from the noise of London, he walked the fields, wrote papers, and tinkered with ideas. The estate was quiet, but his mind was still chasing the laws of the universe. Even in retreat, Maxwell was building something bigger than himself. In 1871, Cambridge called, they needed a leader, someone to shape the future of experimental physics. Maxwell was named the first Cavendish professor. It wasn't a promotion, it was a mission. Maxwell didn't just teach. He built the Cavendish laboratory from the ground up. Every table, every microscope, every corner was designed for discovery. He wasn't just making a building, he was making a machine for truth. Maxwell was more than a genius, he was a guide. At Cavendish, he mentored a new wave of scientists. One of them would split the atom, another would discover the electron. The 20th century began in that classroom. Then came the pain. Maxwell, always full of energy, grew weak. It was abdominal cancer, the same that had taken his mother when he was young, but he never let it show in public. He worked through the agony. As the end drew near, Maxwell wrote to friends, to students. He didn't talk about his suffering. He talked about science, about beauty, about God. Even his goodbye was filled with wonder. On November 5th, 1879, James Maxwell died. He was only 48. No parades, no headlines just a quiet funeral in a country church. The world didn't yet know it had lost one of its greatest minds. Years later, Einstein would say, The work of James Clark Maxwell changed the world forever. He didn't seek fame. He didn't ask for statues. But every glowing screen, every radio wave, every light beam whispers his name. If this story moved you even a little, Please consider liking the video, especially our loyal subscribers who see it first. It really helps the algorithm share it with more people who might need to hear it. And if it didn't resonate with you, we'd still love to hear your thoughts. Honest feedback helps us improve and make better content. If you'd like to see more stories like this, you know where to find us. You can also reach out on social media. Links are on the screen and in the description. We'd love to connect. Thanks for being here. Stay thoughtful, stay curious.